Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Redeemer family. It is so good to see you in the house of the Lord on this beautiful Resurrection Sunday. Christ has risen. Christ has risen. Christ has risen. risen Amen. This is the, the good news of the gospel is that the Lord Jesus has triumphed over sin, over hell, over the grave, over the powers of darkness, and he reigns and rules, and the confession of the church forever has been that we don't serve a dead king, that he is alive, and that he is returning for God's people, and we anticipate that with great joy. Amen? Amen. I want to draw your attention to a few announcements, and then I'm going to have Stuart and Meg Mills come up. Uh, They're missionaries that we've supported for quite some time, and they're here from Peru Mission. And so as we round out our missions month, we're going to close it next week with Reverend J.U., who's going to be coming to uh, bring God's Word. And this is a particular time of the year where we focus on what God is doing both across the street and around the world for the spreading of His fame and His name and His glory to the ends of the earth, beginning right here and going to the uttermost parts of the world. And you all play a significant role in that through your praying and through your going and also through your giving. And so in the coming weeks, we're going to put some um, requests before you as we seek the Lord's uh, will for how to partner with him in this work. Amen. So a few announcements for you. First, uh, Redeemer Explored. It's our new members class. It, It will begin today. And we're going to be meeting in room 109. And we also have our communicants class that's also beginning today. And that's for children who've made professions of faith. Um, We have uh, discipleship and a season of of seven weeks or so where we come alongside of them and, and teach them about the church, our mission, our vision, the gospel. And they will sit before the elders and will be brought into full membership of the church Uh, Families, if you have children who uh, have done so, please let us know. And again, that class will begin today. Also, our two uh, other Sunday school offerings, one on the Psalms and one on um, befriending, creating belonging in a lonely and isolated world. The two of those Sunday school offerings meet. One is in here. uh, The Psalms will meet in here. Befriend will meet in the fellowship hall. Um, So I want to put that uh, before you. There's also some artwork in your bulletin, and it's a collaborative work done by Elijah Norman and Peter Davis. And uh, as you look at that image of the world being made new, it reminds us of the resurrection hope that we have. Redeemer Young Adults has two things that are happening in the near future. One, they're going to be going to the Jazz Festival, April the 6th. But we're also hoping to host uh, an identity seminar Uh, where Dr. Bob Smart, who's a teaching elder in our denomination, uh, will come and be with us. We need 20 of you to uh, respond and sign up by April 15th to make this a reality. Also, we have some graduating seniors from high school. And one of the ways that we can love on them well is by writing them notes and getting them to Stephanie Greer. And so her email is in the bulletin if you want to minister to our high schoolers by words of encouragement, your fab- favorite Bible verses, what have you, please get those to her as soon as possible. We're also uh, accepting applications for our director of music ministry, and I also want to take this time to have Jerome and Elise December and Nicole stand up. So Jerome and your family, will you stand? Uh, if you were here on uh, Friday night. Thank you all. If you were here on Friday night, Jerome blessed us when we had our Good Friday service and we unpacked the final seven words of Jesus. Uh, Jerome and Annalise will be moving here this summer, but he's going to be our next uh, director of neighborhood outreach and missions. And so welcome. Thank you all for coming down. Glad y'all got a house situated and y'all can see the lay of the land, brother. So we look forward to uh, laboring with you, with you guys soon. And lastly, I want to invite Stuart and Meg up. Come on up. Can we praise God for them? Good morning. Praise God that I made it on time. Um, 
but why do we do missions? You know, uh, one, one verse I want to read is 2 Corinthians 4, 5 and 6. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's why we do G- missions, because Jesus has shown his light in us. God has given us the light of Christ. And when I first sensed the call to missions, it was when I became aware of what God has done for me. I have been forgiven of all my sin but through what he has done on the cross. And as we celebrate the resurrection, also the, the forgiveness that we have and that he has called us to be the instruments to go and tell others. And so that there are people around the world, across the street, who will not know this forgiveness unless someone tells them. And that's why we do missions. But then you you might ask, well, why do we go overseas? We have enough needs here. We need to be focusing on our neighbors that are are broken. And the thought that I have in response to that is, why do I brush my teeth if my foot is hurting? We need need to deal with both. We can't just neglect our, 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 our mouth if our foot is hurting, but we have to deal with everything. And in the same way, God has given us a call to be a part of something way bigger than just where we are right in our neighborhood. He's, he calls us to care for our neighborhood, yes. We need to be caring for our neighborhood. We neglect the body if we're worried about across the sea and, neglect, and, and not taking care of our neighborhood. But in the same way, we neglect the body if we're only focused on our neighborhood and not aware of the whole body of Christ. That's who we are. We are a part of it. Just like Paul called the Gentile Christians to go and to to send help to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem during the famine. In the same way, we are called to participate in what God is doing around the world. And um, the United States is so blessed. We have been blessed with so much. The church in the States has been blessed with so much money. And but not only financial blessing. Education. And there are so many people around the world that need education and um, financial help. And that's a big part of why God calls us to go. He calls some of us to stay and to work here, and he calls some of us to go. And the Lord called us. Meg and I, now 13 years ago, we went to Peru. We left from here. And we went, um, we kind of left from here and from Plains. Presbyterian Church in Zachary, Louisiana, but they sent us, y'all sent us, and many other churches sent us, and because y'all have given to support missions, we were able to go and contribute to what God is doing in, across the world in, in Peru. We work with Peru Mission, and we got to participate in what God is doing in building up the city of God in, in, in Peru, and we got to see I got to participate in two guys become pastors in what God was doing and raising them up. And there was another guy that became a pastor while I was there before. Uh, um, but then there are three candidate, pastoral candidates involved in our ministry. The Peru Mission is doing an education a school. Now we're K through 9. It's very similar to, to Redeemer School. And um, a, a seminary work. They call it Christian Artiopagus. And that's a big part of what I got to be a part of. And there are 55 students right now in three different cohorts. We've already graduated the first cohort, so we've done, we've started four. And um, the Lord is doing a lot of work in raising up church, the church building. They're planning a new church in another city called Chimbote. And um, there have been a lot of things that God has let us be a part of. Meg and I also have been involved in marriage counseling. And um, that's one big part of God calling us back to the States and for me to study counseling. But I want to give Meg a chance to share a little bit about, um, about her part in, yeah. in the work here. Okay, so um, I think a good question everybody needs to ask themselves is where God is actually calling you, right? 
And I, I remember in um, high school, our church did a mission trip to Jamaica, and one of the elders said, so, do you think you're called to missions? And I just, ah, oh, of course not. God and his sense of humor and irony um, keeps showing up. Um, so I just wanted to encourage y'all to just show up, whether it's here for a ministry, across town, wherever. The amount of learning you have received through faithful preaching that we get every week, Sunday school, workshops, whatever, it's so much more than what the typical person anywhere else has received. You will be amazed how much Bible knowledge you actually have. <laughs> um, and you may not have a seminary education, but just show up, you know, show up, and God will use what you have whether it's local, international, cross-cultural, or just here. Um, so one part of being a missionary is wearing multiple hats. Um, I've done Bible studies. I've done exercise class. I've taught little children Sunday school, which brought me to tears. Um, music recording. I was president of the school board one year. I've done talks about science and Christianity and making North American desserts. We've covered the gamut. We've led music the last years after COVID. Um, but where I got to see the most amount of change was in a very dear friend. Uh, we struggled together. We cried together. We encouraged each other. And I feel like this one person, if God took me to Peru for any reason, it'd be her. Um, and just being able to watch her life change over the span of 13 years was an amazing blessing. And lastly, God just worked in me, um, whether it's short-term or long-term. I mean, we, we often go and we think, oh, you know, God's going to God's gonna use me to help these poor people. <laughs> no, I mean, I think the level of sanctification that God in my life <laughs> was tremendous. It was painful. It was hard. Um, but God showed me my heart, and he helped me, and he worked in me. So I just want to thank you for your support and prayers, um, also financials, and um, thank you for sending me on this great sanctification trip. And I would encourage you to do the same, whether long-term or short-term, but thank you. Um, just a, a thank, I also wanted to say thank you for supporting us, for sending us. We spent 13 years in Peru. And, but then now, as I mentioned the needs around the world, God has called us back. And I see need here and brokenness here and a desire to enter into counseling. And, and um, our plan is now to, to not return back to Peru to, to be missionaries. But as I'm studying counseling and Meg is back into research, our plan is to go back to Louisiana and serve in, in counseling there but also continue sort of supporting the work in Peru, continue supporting uh, maybe even all of South America, but also consider going on a mission trip, um, going and serving um, and, and contributing what we have and ask you to all to consider, like, as Meg asked, um, is he calling you? And what is he calling you to? To support with, with financial support or with, um, your, with what God has given you in skills? And, and is he calling you to, to give? Or to go. Thank you. Um.
Good morning, Redeemer. Would you please stand for our call to worship? Our call to worship this morning comes from Revelation chapter 5. Here now as I read God's word aloud as he calls us to worship him. Then I saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, The root of David has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll... The four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. This is God's word. Would you be seated and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you. Thank you for gathering us here to worship you this morning. Thank you that you hear our prayers as we read your word in Revelation chapter 5 and and we hear of the elders and all the living creatures in heaven and on earth who are bowing down and worshiping and praising your name. Father, we are reminded that you are worthy of our worship. Lord, I come before you at this time on my behalf and on all those gathered to confess our sin. Sin which has separated us from you. And apart from you, we can never be reconciled to you. Lord, we have put other gods and worldly things before you. We have fashioned idols with our hands. We have used your name in vain. We have forgotten to keep your Sabbath and we have not kept it holy. We have dishonored our parents and all of us in our hearts have committed murder adultery, we have stolen, we have slandered our neighbors, and we have coveted what is not ours. Oh Lord, we are a sinful people, but Lord, you are a gracious God, and you have sent your Son into this world to save us from our sin and to deliver us. And Lord, this morning we celebrate that he is risen, that the tomb is empty. And so Lord, I pray now, Holy Spirit, would you fill us Would you give us seeing eyes and hearing ears so that we might see you more clearly, so that we might put off the old man and live into our new righteousness that is purchased by Christ. And Holy Spirit, I ask that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Christian. Hear now this assurance of pardon. 
from God's Word in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace. These are God's words. Now, Redeemer, let's stand and sing. was buried beneath my sin. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my turn till I Oh 
Hallelujah. We worship and serve a risen king. Let's go to him now in prayer. Mighty, redeeming, loving God, our loving Father, what a joy and wonder it is that you are here with us. On Friday, we meditated on the last words of Jesus as he suffered on our behalf. The events of that Good Friday by themselves seem anything but good. Yes, Jesus applied his innocence to us. But the other side of that transaction brought the horror of our sin on the blood-soaked head and the undeserving heart of Christ. And he endured it completely alone, abandoned by his friends and forsaken by his father. That was Friday, the day of death and sacrifice, blood, pain, mourning. Today we're remembering how you turned the shame, the agony, the de defeat of Friday into the perfect act of redemption on that first Easter. Today we celebrate an empty tomb. Today our guilt of putting you on the cross is covered by the joy of a cosmic victory over sin and death. Lord, it's fitting that we celebrate in these bright clothes of spring, family meals, Easter egg hunts, even as all of nature joins in with beautiful weather and explosions of bright buds and blooms. This faith that you called us to forces us to hold on to grace in one hand and your perfect unwavering law in the other. And the two feel at odds with each other in us, at times threatening to pull us apart. But it is your love perfectly expressed in the resurrection that promises grace and justice for our good and your glory. Hallelujah. Lord, there's much before us this year. Here at 640 East Northside Drive, we're asking you to bless the Redeemer School as its leadership stewards its physical and spiritual growth towards an impactful future for the good of our students, our city, and always glorifying you. Bless Kelly and the, the staff, the faculty, board, as they work on big projects this year. Father, our city, Jackson, it needs your presence. Let Christ be our example as we seek to be salt and light in America's reigning murder capital. It was one year and six, six days ago that our sister Jubilee Simpkins was killed. Trials are scheduled soon, and we're praying for justice, but we're also praying for grace for our city. Give us wisdom to move towards our city, broken as it is, and towards our neighbors in, lo in love. Give our police chiefs, our mayor, city council, and other city leaders supernatural understanding and energy and grace to love our city with purpose. We're lifting up Katie Trotter and Lydia Abraham, that they will feel your healing touch and know your presence even through the fear and pain that they're experiencing. Others among us today are distracted from the gift and the promise of the resurrection by unspoken troubles in relationships or job, health, grief, money. Maybe it's depression. Could be fear, bitterness, or anger over an episode from the past. 
Lord, these are things that keep us from hearing your voice. Make us a church that shares our pains with each other so that many prayers are offered to you for one another. And there's one more echo of the resurrection promise that we should notice. Little Oliver Fields for Compass was born on the 20th. He and the other children in our church, what a beautiful picture of the renewal that is ours in Christ that you made possible by your resurrection. And now bless our Pastor L as he prepares to open your word so that truth does its work in us today. And we're praying in the name of our big brother in the faith, Jesus Christ. Amen. As the ushers come forward, uh, find the connect pad, if you will, and uh, let us know that you're here. We'd love to welcome you. Let's pray. And now, Lord, we thank you for these gifts that you provide through your people. Make us a generous, generous people who know the true source of whatever wealth we have. Amen.
Thank you. Thank you, choir. Thank you, musicians. All right, let's pronounce the benediction. We can go. No, thank you so much, man. It, it blesses our hearts and souls to see y'all rehearse and to practice and to give your talents unto the Lord. Thank you so much for leading us in worship. Redeemer family, if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. I'll be reading verses 8 through 11. Normally, if you're here, I work through books of the Bible and we look at every single verse and and try to go deep into that this morning. I want to I do something a bit different. I want to focus in on an idea and then try to unpack that idea from the book of Philippians and maybe a few other verses. And I want to convince you this morning that the resurrection is a game changer. The resurrection of Jesus from the grave is a game changer. All right, I'm going to read and I'm going to pray. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And here's what I want to focus in on verse 10 and 11 that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. Let's pray. Father, would you please uh, speak to your people and would you give me uh, unction to know, Lord, what to say and not to say, what to edit Uh, Father, I I leave room in a manuscript, Lord, for your spirit to superintend and to bless your people. And so would you do that? Jesus, thank you that you are alive. That right now you stand at the right hand of the Father and you make intercession for your people. Paul tells us since we have been raised with Christ, that we're to set our minds on things above. And so the resurrection changes the orientation of our lives and our thoughts. And so, Jesus, would that be true even now? I pray this in your name. Amen. Game changer. When was the last time you heard someone use that phrase? Maybe you're watching the NCAA tournaments, the men or the women, and the tide is turning one way, and all of a sudden somebody gets hot or somebody comes off the bench and they get a pivotal rebound or somebody makes four three-pointers in a row and, and it changes the tide of the game and the commentators at the end of the game, they will pinpoint right there that person who did those things, that's the game changer. Or maybe you, you were playing spades, the card game, and maybe you and your partner, you guys or girls are getting drugged and, and the other team that you're playing against, all they need is four books and they're done. The game is over. And you look at your hand and you tell your partner, partner, I see seven books and two possibles. <laughs> and your partner says, well, I see three books and two possibles. And, and you know that, 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 that emotion, right? That feeling when both of you look up at the same time, you realize You can get 10 books and you can get 200 and you can end the game. The the tide of the game, the outcome is turned with with one hand. Or maybe you're like us. My wife's uh, friend tricked her into getting a food subscription service. (laughs) We got like the 10 free meals and it's a game changer in our house, y'all. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to promote who we're using because they got to pay me for marketing. <laughs> but it's a game changer with kids and sports and late night meetings and we're both working. Like, it's just hard to like figure out what we're going to eat and when we're going to cook. And it's hard right now. And in comes this subscription service. They just drop food off at the door and we have enough food for the four of us and it's cheaper than going to Chick-fil-A and it takes 30 minutes to cook 
We walked we walked in one night, Karen and I, and, and my kids were in the kitchen cooking dinner, and it took them 30 minutes. It's a game changer. Beloved, when you think about the resurrection of Jesus, it's a game changer. It alters everything that the tides of depression, the tides of sorrow, the tides of shame, the tides of condemnation, it's turned because Jesus is alive. And if we say that Jesus has been resurrected, then it implies that he has died. And what we try to press upon you at our Good Friday service from seven different preachers who all kind of preach within six to eight minutes, except for me, right? (laughs) Was that central truth. He died. The one who knew no sin became sin for you, that you and him might become the righteousness of God that we talked about, that last act of obedience, even from the cross, Jesus was obeying, and the last act of obedience was him offering up his own life, and that sacrifice of obedience was simultaneously the way in which God passes over you, your and my sin. But we don't serve a dead Savior. He's alive. And the resurrection changes everything. And what I want to do this morning is just show you and nudge you in that direction that his resurrection is a game changer. I'm not here to debate the historicity of the resurrection. There are people who've written about that. There are good books out there. The Holy Spirit alone can convert you to believe that. What I'm here to do is just to say that these are some implications This is why it matters. And so the first thing I want us to think about this morning is the importance of the resurrection. If you're taking notes, the the importance of the resurrection. John Stott says that Christianity is in its very essence a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove it, Christianity is destroyed. C.S. Lewis says the Christian story is one grand miracle. It's the assertion that he who is beyond all space and time, uncreated and eternal, he came into nature, into human nature, and died and rose again. It is precisely one great miracle. If you take that away, there is nothing specifically Christian left. You hear what they're saying? But these are just men. What does the Bible say? Paul says in Romans chapter 10, and I want you to to, to try to fill in the blank because I think it's going to show us ways in which we can minimize the resurrection. Here's what Paul says in Romans 9, I mean Romans 10, 9 and 11. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that blank, you will be saved. Now here's what we will often do. We will often import right there if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he died for your sins, then you will be saved. That's not what Paul says in Romans 10. He says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Do you hear the the emphasis right there? What about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15? For I deliver unto you that which was of first importance, that which I received, that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Do you hear what Paul is saying? You can forget everything else I said, but here's what you cannot forget, that the most important thing to know, according to the scriptures, is that Jesus Christ lived, Jesus Christ died, he died for your sins, and God did not leave him dead. God raised him, and that was according to the scriptures? What was Paul's scripture when he penned 1 Corinthians? It was the Old Testament. 
And so Paul is actually saying the Old Testament is preaching to you that Messiah would come, Messiah would die, Messiah would suffer, Messiah would be raised. The pangs of death could not hold him. God would raise him up. And the question becomes where? You could go to Job, where he says, I know my Redeemer lives, and in the end he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed... Yet I will see God for myself. With my own eyes, I shall behold him. My heart faints within me. That's Job who's being afflicted, who's watched his family be obliterated, who's watched his children die. And he actually says, I'm going to go near them. I'm going to die one day. However, I know in the end, I'm going to be raised. Or you could take Jesus' own words He says that just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so here's what Jesus is doing. He's giving us a hermeneutic to read Jonah. Jonah is not just about a great fish that swallows a hard-hearted prophet who then gets vomited out where God wants him to go. Yes, that's there, but Jonah is preaching the resurrection. Jonah is preaching, says Jesus, that as he went in and stayed there and then was sent out, so I'm going to step out of the grave. He could be talking about Genesis 3, where the the serpent and the woman and the man, the woman will give birth to a son, and the son will bruise the head of the serpent, but his heels will be bruised. One's a mortal blow, and one is one that's going to appear mortal, but he's going to walk with a limp, right? That's the imagery there. Now, notice what Paul says in our passage. Paul is a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. We're studying Jacob. That's, that's, that's Rachel's last son with Jacob. He's of Benjamin. He's a Pharisee. He's a zealot. He's righteous according to the law. And then Paul actually says, All of those things that are about me, circumcised on the eighth day, all of those things that would have commended me to God, I count them as nothing for the surpassing knowledge of Jesus and his resurrection. That's all that matters to me now. It's not who I am. It's not what I commended to the Lord. The one who commends me to the Lord now is Jesus. And that's the one that I want to know better than anything and anyone. And I don't just want to know him. I want to know the power of and the importance of his resurrection. Paul wants to delight in the resurrection, now to help him suffer, and in the future when he dies and goes to be with Jesus. Which moves us to the second point. I want us to think about the ease and the cost of underemphasizing Jesus' resurrection. Saints, I think we just, it's easy for us to de-emphasize that. And whenever you de-emphasize a central doctrine, you can bet that it's hurting you and that it's hurting others. And so maybe you're not convinced. This is what Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers in the 1800s, this is what he wrote. He says, I was surprised to find that I had not been copying the apostolic fashion half as nearly as I might have done. The apostles, when they preached, always testified to the resurrection of Jesus and the consequent resurrection of the dead. That is the truth that we believe, but which we seldom preach or care to read about. I went looking for books on the resurrection at booksellers and I've not been able to purchase one of any sort whatsoever. That's Charles Spurgeon reflecting on his ministry and said, I'm sad because I've not accented that in my preaching. A few weeks ago, I was at what we call the HBCU Link, and it's a conference 
that uh, Cyril, you remember Cyril, who's RUF at Howard, and me and a few other people that, that this is the third year and we've done it in Columbia, South Carolina. And it's an attempt to help come alongside of um, men and women who are laboring on historically black campuses. So how do we equip them to uh, labor on those campuses? Because there are some unique challenges, right? And uh, Anthony Bradley, Dr. Anthony Bradley was there and he did a breakout seminar on how to reach men on the campus. And here's what he said, and I, I want to quote him. He says, the reduction of the gospel to substitutionary atonement is culturally situated in the Puritan tradition. Instead of John Owen's gospel articulation, men need the gospel as expressed in our confession of faith. The substitutionary atonement gospel is not the entire gospel. It is a part, a big part of the gospel. And then he goes on to say that the gospel, as articulated in the Presbyterian and the Anglican traditions and the traditional black church, it includes Christus Victor, right? That's Latin for Christ the Victor, the, the one who, who conquers and then he cites the, com the book of common prayer. He says, what is redemption? Redemption is the act of God in which he sets us free. You get the language. He sets us free from the power of evil and sin and death. Then he quotes the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 20. And we just sang about it. The liberty which Christ has purchased for believers in the gospel considers uh, consists of freedom from guilt of sin, the condemning wrath of God, the curse of the moral law, being delivered from this present evil age, bondage to Satan, sting of death, and victory over the grave. He says men's lives are profoundly under attack, and, and I don't think this just means men. All of our lives are profoundly under attack. We good on that? All right. The devil is busy. You cannot truly reach men with the gospel that does not fully unlock the power of the resurrection in the cosmos and their response to it and their, their role in the story of redemption as accomplished by Christ. Attempting to reach black men on the college campus and have them adopt the historically situated gospel expressions of the 17th century Puritans as the comprehensive gospel is a surefire way to miss reaching them in 2024. You hear what he's saying? that a surefire way to miss ministering to men or women is to give us a small gospel that, that just looks at Jesus dying for our sins and we leave him in the grave and not a gospel that's full that I delivered unto you that which was of chief importance that he lived, he died, and he was raised in power. Right? That's what he's pushing against. Don't leave your Jesus on a cross. Don't leave your Jesus in a grave. Your Jesus has conquered death. Your Jesus has conquered the final enemy. Your Jesus has triumphed over the powers of the world and the rulers of the world and the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Paul says, believer, the Holy Spirit now abides in you. Don't settle for a weak gospel. Adrian Warnock, in his book, The Resurrection Changes Everything, he says two things. The resurrection has been eclipsed by the prominence of the cross, but we must remember that the cross is just as empty as the tomb. Woo, y'all hear that? The cross is just as empty as the tomb. And Christ is glorified, having completed his work. The truth is, we cannot be truly cross-centered without being empty grave-centered. Y'all hear what they're pushing against? And he goes on to say that Jesus is not just your prophet and your priest. He's your living king. He says, our neglect of the resurrection could be part of a satanic strategy. Satan has two strategies to undermine truths that are essential to our faith. 
The first is to approach it, to assault it directly by encouraging us to doubt it and form wrong conclusions about it. Heresy. That's what he's saying. That's, that, that's Satan's, that, that's his modus operandi. Number one is to create heresy. But he says he has something else that is subtle. It's by merely assuming doctrine. Right? Since the power of the resurrection is what enables us to live as Christians, it should come as no surprise that Satan is trying to stop us from applying that power to our lives. You hear that? Now here's the thing. What happens if we neglect essential doctrines of the faith? Right? What if you deny the image of God in every human? You know what starts to happen in our world? Chattel slavery, right? You know what happens in our world when we neglect the image of God? Rampant violence, where black folk kill black folk. You know what happens when we neglect the image of God? Domestic violence. You know what happens when we neglect the image of God? Police officers who make men drink their urine in prison. Right. You catch you catch that when you begin to neglect that every single man, woman, child, black, white, old, young, rich, poor. We are in the image of God. We are the image of God. And when you begin to touch that and deny that, you start to see heartache and pain radiate from that. Now, here's a question. When you neglect the resurrection of Jesus, What heartache and pain radiates from it? We stay stuck. And this is personal. And those things that ensnare us, they overwhelm us. And we begin to get discouraged because, uh, uh, Lord, like, I, I can't, like, fight this. And so we live defeated, walking around here not saying so. The power, the the Holy Spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. You're too good for that. Right? We begin to grieve and bury other believers. And the grief just overwhelms us because we don't understand and we're not laying hold that the final enemy has been defeated by Christ. And so death looms large. And then you hear Paul say things in this text. He says, I don't know which one to do. He says, I want to stay and I want to keep ministering to you. But what I also want to do is die and go be with Jesus. When do we talk like that? You can only talk like that if the resurrection is big and the resurrection is real, that you can stare suffering and heartache and loss and grief in the face and say you don't get the last word. Which moves us to our last point. What are some of the manifold blessings that are yours because Jesus is alive? In this book, Paul wrote this letter to the church in Philippi. But Paul was in prison, y'all. In chapter one, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel that has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment, he's in prison, is for Christ. In fact, it reads as if he thinks that death is looming large. What anchors him in prison with the sentence coming? What anchors him is the resurrection. Paul knows that he's eventually going to die. He's been appointed for him to suffer. He should be in a panic. 
He should be in a panic over what's going to happen to the church in Philippi. I'm the mighty apostle, and I'm the one that's writing you. I'm the one that came and preached the gospel, and, and, and he's going to die. He knows he's going to die. He should be, by earthly standards, trembling and fretting. What's going to happen to the church? What's going to happen to them? And notice what Paul writes in Philippians 1, verse 6. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will complete it. That's a word for some of y'all, some of us, not y'all, us, who got kids. And you, maybe you're getting old, and maybe you're worrying, are they going to come to a knowledge of truth? What Paul says right here, I'm going to die, but my Lord ain't. And he's going to still work. And whatever God started, God's going to finish because your God ain't dead. He's alive. And so Paul can say, the God who is alive, who started this work in you, my church, I can go to sleep and go be with him in peace because your sanctification and salvation, it ain't dependent on me. Him, he's alive. That's resurrection hope in ministry. But it's not just resurrection hope in ministry. It's resurrection hope for the minister. Paul says, I know that it will all turn out for my deliverance. It is my hope with full courage now and always that Christ will be honored in my body by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is game. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means more fruitful work for me. I'm hard pressed between the two. If I remain alive, that's great. But it's far better that I go be with Jesus. But notice what Paul says before that. He says, I know this is going to turn out for my deliverance. Wait a minute. How? how? He says, if Jesus delivers me and gives me more life of ministry, I'm delivered. And if they kill me and I go see with Jesus and be with Jesus, guess what? I'm delivered. He says, so it doesn't matter either way you go because Jesus is alive. I'm delivered. You catch that? It's resurrection courage that's yours right now. In Philippians 1, 28, Paul says, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel and do not be frightened in anything by your opponents. What? How can he tell them don't be frightened? Because he knows the rest of the story. That Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. God has exalted him and bestowed upon him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And so Paul is telling them, them folks ain't got nothing on you. They are going to bow the knee to King Jesus. So take courage. You have resurrection power right now. Of all the things that Paul wants in prison, In other books, he's going to write about his books, his parchments, his cloak. He wants visitors. But right here in this letter, he says, man, I just want to know Jesus and the power of his resurrection. That's what he wants. He believes that Jesus, by his power, will turn his weakness into strength, will turn his fear into hope will turn his terror into worship. And that is because the Holy Spirit abides in him to work something in him that he can't work up himself. You also have resurrection reunion. Over in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says the Lord will descend at the sound of a trumpet and the voice of an archangel and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and we will always be with one another and the Lord. Encourage one another with these words. Second Corinthians 4, Paul says, we know that he who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will raise all of us with Jesus and bring all of us into his presence. Do you understand what Paul is saying? Resurrection is not just individual. It's collective. And a 
blessing of the resurrection is that every single person who's died in Jesus, everybody's going to be resurrected, right? So let's just go there. Everybody's going to get resurrected. But those who, ride, who are united with Jesus will be raised. And Paul says we'll, we'll happen together and we will be with one another and Jesus forever. And Kirk Franklin's song, Caught Up, Shirley Caesar, who is the queen of gospel music. Y'all got to go listen to that song. I listened to it all week. Around the four minute mark of that song, she ad libs. She's like, she said, I got a mother waiting on me. Anybody got a mother there? I got a father there. I got sisters and brothers there. And here's what you may not know. She was one of 13 children. And she's the only one alive. And so when she's singing about the resurrection, she has her eyes on Jesus. And she has her eyes, as the text tells us, on all of her family who bowed the knee and trusted in Jesus. And so maybe you're here today and you don't think you're going to make it through 2024. Or maybe you're walking with someone who's sick. Or maybe you've suffered loss. I got a call yesterday from Roy Hubbard's brother saying that his mom died, right? This happens. And the good news of the gospel, saints, Jesus has overcome the grave. There is a reunion coming. There is a reunion coming where God's people will be with God and Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever. Take courage, rest in the goodness of God. I'll close with this. Realtors, uh, I don't know who does it. Maybe realtors do it. All right, houses will get what they call a livability score. And a livability score is some arbitrary number that they come up with where they rank your particular neighborhood or your particular house based on some other factors, based on access to clean water, access to food, transportation, education, safety, and health care. Right? Now here's the thing. All six of those things are good, right? They're, they're really good. But answer me this. Don't they mean a little different, kind of depending on what you're going through? If you got a five-year-old, the education system, you, that might bring really high to you in that moment, right? Or if you're older, what might rank really high to you in that moment is access to health care. In other words, th this whole score is good, but given where we are in life and, and what we need the most, certain things about the livability score appeal to us more. What is it this morning that appeals to you most about the resurrection? Is it reunion? Praise God. Is it a besetting sin that you need help conquering and mastering? The resurrection got an answer for that too. Is it courage to speak the gospel? The resurrection gives you that too. Is it hope? The resurrection gives you that too. Beloved, the resurrection of Jesus truly does change everything. Maybe you're here. You don't know Jesus. I do pray that as we hear and contemplate his word together, that today might be a day where you trust not only in his death, but also his resurrection. 
Amen? Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for your word and the goodness thereof. Meet your people. Minister to us all right where we need. Your resurrection is a game changer for us all. May we make much of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing, saints. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, two announcements. One, we do have Sunday school that's going to be kicking off our second semester. Also, um, we ran out of bulletin. So if you don't want your bulletin, just leave it at the door. Amen. All right. Gene and Betty Marsh are going to be down front to pray with you if you want, uh, to pray, want them to pray with or for you. Receive the benediction from the book of Ephesians. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.